Welcome to this week's episode of Sussex Sport Weekly Podcast. I'm Matt Pohl and this week I'm joined by Brighton and Hove Albion writers Darren Howard and Frankie Elliott and Crawley Town expert Mark Dumpford. Brighton and Hove Albion have discovered their itinerary for the 2023-24 Premier League campaign. We'll take a look at the big dates of the Seagulls and cast their eye at the latest goings on at Crawley Town. The Sussex Cricket League is also in full swing. We'll take a look at the early runners and riders in the Premier Division and Divisions 2 and 3 and look ahead to this summer's highly anticipated Ashes Test Series between old enemies England and Australia. But, as mentioned at the top of the podcast, Brighton and Hove Albion have learned their 23-24 Premier League fixtures and they will begin their campaign at home to newly promoted Luton Town on Saturday the 12th of August. Um, and as open as go, Darren, I think most Albion fans will be pretty pleased with that. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think you're right. It's uh, it'll be a great um, a great occasion, especially for the Luton Town fans as well. It'll be the you know it's such an unexpected rise when you look where they were a few seasons ago, and now they'll be and now they're in the in the Premier League, and uh, it's going to be um, quite an occasion. I think Brighton will be obviously you know buoyed up because it's the first uh, first fixture of the season as as well. So um, so yeah, it'll be one that the fans are really really looking forward to and. And especially the Luton Town fans who um, who will get to see their side in in the Premier League um, for the first time, and it would be it'd be a real test for them. And for Brighton, it's a bit, a bit of a step into the unknown. You're not quite sure what to expect from from Luton. If it had been an established Premier League team, you know you you kind of get a feel for it. Deserby would have been up against the managers uh, previously, um, but yeah, it's it's a great opportunity uh, for Luton to to really make uh, make a statement on the opening day of the season in the Premier League. And um, yeah, I'm sure they'll be really fired up for it. So, so yeah, and I'm sure the fans will love it as well for the Brighton fans as well. It'd be a good a good occasion to to see Luton back up in, in the top flight. And um, and then, yeah, let's, uh, let's see see what happens, see how Brighton react to, to the, the new signings that will be coming in as well, which a lot of... So it'd be the first time fans have got to see, you know, Jao Pedro and James Milner, who joined this week as as well. So it would be a good a good occasion. I expect a lively atmosphere on the opening opening day of the season. Well, next season we'll also see Brian compete in the Europa League for the very first time. Uh, the Seagulls Premier League games after their Thursday evening group games in order are currently, although this is probably subject to change from television. Uh, Bournemouth, Liverpool, Fulham, and Sheffield United all at home followed by Arsenal and Chelsea away. Um, Frankie, how would you assess that batch of fixtures? And do you think the hope is that they've qualified from the group before the Arsenal game so they can rest players in midweek? Because those last two look particularly testing for them. Well, I mean, I think if I'm being br brutally honest, and it is being brutally honest, I think Brighton, their only hope will be that they're not struggling at that point in the season. Mm. Um, I think if we're looking at it in, in the cold hard facts, Currently, they've lost McAllister, who was one of yeah. their best players last season. They're probably going to lose Caicedo as well. Um, we know how important a central midfield is to Brighton and also to any successful team. And they're losing their two best and starting players, regular players, before a ball has been kicked. And on top of that, the fact they're playing three times a week for the first time as a club and a lot of these players for the first time. Um, and then if you look at the Europa League itself... Uh, Brighton are likely to be in pot three, mm. which means that they will either draw a team from pot one, which could be either Roma, Ajax, Villarreal, and Sporting Lisbon, all teams with uh, long and, and good histories in, in Europe of certainly getting into knockout stages and, and winning competitions. Villarreal won it in 2021. The Europa League, Roma, obviously finalists last year, Conference League winners the year before that. And then in pot two, Slavia Prague, very, very difficult team. A very difficult away game, certainly. PSV, Olympiacos, Marseille. Again, all teams that have played in the Champions League have experience of playing European football. So if Brian were to draw, you know, those have a have a tough draw by having those one from each of those pots. Plus the fact in pot four, you've got teams that are from Belarus and Serbia. Those are long, long ways mm. to travel in midweek. You know, it's, it's going to be tough. The Europa League is going to be tough. You know, England's only had four winners from the last 23 years. Even the big teams have struggled in Europe. Look at Manchester United and Arsenal last season. They didn't make it to the to the semi-finals. So the Europa League adventure will be will be a, will be a struggle for them. Plus the fact their best players who are more um, who could probably be more acquitted to play in that uh, competition aren't going to be there. So when you look at the the run of games 
after those Europa League ties, those four f first four games, the fact they're at home is a blessing. I have to say, mm. I think I've judging from what I've seen from all the Premier League, I think the Premier League have made a, um, a special effort to make sure all European clubs play at home. They can't, you know, they can't make it every time. But I think Arsenal's first six games, so their six games after their Champions League games, they're all at home. Um, I think they've tried mm. made a real effort to he help the the European sides out by not making them have to travel away from home straight after traveling from from a European game um but you know we can we can never really read too much into to the fixture list at this point because we're so early on in the transfer window mm. we don't know what squads are going to look like we don't know what moves are going to take place and we don't know how the early season form will will, will will pan out so like I said the only thing that I think Brian fans can hope for is that they're playing well come mm. Arsenal, Arsenal away uh in December or, or November whenever it is and Chelsea away as well because so much is going to be new to them and so much is going to have changed from when they last played Aston Villa uh mm. back in back in May this year that we can we can only hope that Brighton fans can only hope that they're still playing good football, which they hopefully will do under Deserby. That's the most important thing. They've got the manager that's been responsible for them playing this attractive football that's got them into the Europa League. But maintaining those levels alongside all the factors that I've just listed will be a huge challenge come mm. playing at the Emirates in December. We're looking more closely at Albion's fixtures. Um, September and October sees Deserby's men take on the likes of Newcastle, Man United, Aston Villa, Liverpool and Man City. Mm. Uh, again, everything is subject to the whims of television, so that may change. But um, would you say this is Albion's toughest run of fixtures, Darren? And if so, is it good for Albion to get this out of the way and done with quite early in the season? Yeah, it's it's tough to predict, isn't it? It's um, it, on you know, it looks a really, a really, really tough test, uh, tough group of matches that they're going to be up against. And um, and Brighton, you know, they they struggled a bit against Newcastle last season. They get a point a point at home against them and then uh, and then they they were compensably beaten by a very good Newcastle team uh, albeit at the end of the season when Brighton were you know running on fumes really mm. Aston Villa they they lost to them at the end of last season but um Liverpool they they recorded some some good results against previously so I think Brighton can you know they against some of the best teams they played their best football uh last season um, so I think they can always go into these matches with a, with a you know, a, a, an element of confidence um, uh, to tackle these. Uh, it's going to be very difficult because this season is going to be a completely new challenge. Uh, as Frankie mentioned, no McAllister, Casado is probably going to go as well. Um, so it really depends on how this new midfield that De Zerbe is going to try and uh, rebuild, how they how they settle in. And whether they're capable of dominating the games and dominating the possession as as McAllister and Caicedo helped them to do so well. So it's gonna be tricky. It's gonna how they how they start the season, I think, is is really uh, gonna be key to how the new uh, new style, uh, not style as such, because I think Deserby's you know plan is will stay the same to to dominate the possession and to create chances way back from Jason Steele moving forward. But how they actually settle in, how they start the season, will be key to to um, to their chances in this in this little batch of of fixtures. And obviously, you know, there's this Europa League challenge as as well. So it's a whole new whole new context this this season. And um, these are going to be some great games to to watch as well. When when Brighton are at teams that want to play good football against them as well, that's when you really see Brighton at their best. They they love it when teams can try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. They struggle at times when it's a bit more defensive and Brighton yeah. have to sort of break through the lines and break them down. Uh, that's when they've struggled. So against the top teams, I think they will go in the, into this group of matches with, uh, with nothing to fear, as they did last season. Uh, any other fixtures catch your eye? Frankie, I suppose the main one for Albion fans to look out for is the Crystal Palace clashes. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's the age-old saying that the the first fixture you look for is your is your derby day, and I'm sure all the Brighton fans have checked when the Palace games are. But for for myself, I'm looked at two games. I think uh, obviously they've got Luton at home on the first day of the season, uh, but they actually travel to to Kenilworth Road uh, in the 30th of January currently. Mm. Um, I think. Obviously, it's been well documented now, I'm sure, about the, the Luton Town crowd and how old school it is. The away end, of course, being uh, behind some 
uh, being in line with some some old derelict houses. Um, but I think for Luton, in, in, in it especially, I think that ground is going to be key to them mm. staying up. I think they can make that place a real fortress by making it an old school, uh, tough away day for, for 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 the Premier League millionaires and and foreign players that have, uh, are not used to playing at grounds like that. So. Mm. Travelling there, it, it could be the age-old adage, you know, the Tuesday night in Stoke, going to Kenilworth Road in January doesn't sound particularly appealing. So how does Irby t tackles that, I think, will be very, very interesting. And then, of course, if, um, we don't know about Moises Caicedo yet, but Alexis McAllister has gone and his return to the Amex on the 7th of October um, should be a nice uh, moment. I don't, obviously, he won't be booed. I think, you know, mm. Brian fans have too much respect for him. But it's been difficult for players coming back to the Amex, you know, I think Trossard struggled against Brighton in, in, in May for Arsenal. Obviously, Cucurella and Potter, uh, under much more dubious circumstances, had a difficult time when they came to the Amex in October. And I think, not that he will be booed, but I think giving him a tough game can benefit Brighton overall. So I'm interested to see how, how Liverpool play and how McAllister, if he starts, how he how he is suited to that Liverpool team uh, against the Zerbys, Zerbys Brighton. So those two games, I think, uh, for me, will be the most interesting. Can we make any kind of early predictions about Brighton so far after seeing the fixtures or it's just the case of as you were, chaps? <sighs> too early for me. Way, way too early. Darren? Um, yeah, I, I did a piece um, on the Sussex World website where once the fixtures releases, uh, new fixtures are released, all the predictions come, uh, <laughs> come through. And the bookmakers, they have Brighton to finish eighth um, yeah. this, this season. So... Um, Drop down a couple of places after after a sixth place finish last season. I think most fans would take that if they mm. if they do finish eighth, um, especially as they try and combine. Because it's such an important transfer window for them this season. They have to they have to improve their squad to cope with Europe, but also <laughs> on the back of losing their two best players as well. Mm. So it sounds like an almost impossible task, but you have to. The way Brighton have managed previous transfers and transfer windows, you have to sort of give them so much credit in the last few years that you think that they, you know, they could get this these decisions right as well. And but you, it, they have to really because it's mm. going to be uh, such a tough challenge uh, this season with with the demands that's going to be in place next season and uh, and the players that are leaving. But I think Milner's and Pedro's arrival will will certainly help them. Well, speaking of um, Pedro and Milner's arrival, um, Brighton officially announced the signings of the pair from Watford and Liverpool respectively this week. Uh, Darren, how excited should Seagulls fans be with these acquisitions and, and where do you see them featuring for Roberto De Zerbe's side? I, I saw that you did a predicted 11 for Brighton next season. You had Milner at right back. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's been a problem area for Brighton in the last uh, last few seasons. And and I think Milner's uh, experience will really help them in, in, that, in that department. Um, Ideally, you'd like to see Tarek Lamptey sort of break through and, and have, you know, fulfil his potential on, on that right flank next season. But there's going to be so many matches for him to play. And he's he's had he's had a few injuries, hasn't he, with the hamstring. Mm. Uh, he just got back to his best from the hamstring and then his knee went. So, you know, it's going to be an ask to, for him to play that volume of, of games that's going to be required next season in all four competitions. So... So having the likes of Joel Veltman, hopefully he'll stay, and then James Milner as well coming in, who can cover uh, at right back, and Milner can also play in the midfield as uh, as well. Um, which you know, with even though he's he's you know coming, he'll be coming up to thirty eight uh, mm -hmm. next season, um, but he's he he just looks like a real athlete still. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he looks after his you know his body so well. Um, as sort of been mentioned before, he's completely teetotal, completely hundred percent professional, and he will set he will set the standards. And alongside him, and Adam Lalana, you know, uh, Lewis Dunk, Pascal Gross, uh, that's some great senior players for these younger lads who are just coming into the game at 18, 19, likes of Inciso, uh, Yasin Ari as well. To to look at these guys and think, well, you know, I can have a long career, you know, and earn earn huge amounts of money over this next you know period of of my career if i if i follow this guy's example and be as successful as him so so i think he will bring that to the to the team as well so he will not only add to the squad in the playing terms but also the uh, the type of character that he is will help these younger players as well 
and he's he's almost fluent in Spanish as well, apparently. Oh. Um, according to I saw a quote from Jurgen Klopp saying he speaks um, uh, semi-fluent Spanish, which will certainly help him with the uh, with the South American guys that that Brighton have. Um, Joel Pedro, he looks he looks very exciting. I think he could be a uh, a really good player for Brighton. He can play in numerous positions across across the front line. He's powerful. He's skillful. Um, you look at his goals record, and it's it's not you know he hasn't sort of set the world alight mm. in terms of the amount of goals he scores. But um, I think under Deserby in this structure, his Deserby's attacking style, I think he's going to get goal. He'll he'll add goals to his game, and um, Brighton could have a, a very a very talented uh, addition to their to their squad. And you think with him, Solly March, Mitoma, Ferguson. Undav Welbeck, there's plenty of options now. In CISO as as well, he can he can he can be a threat as as well going forward. So, I, I think Jao Pedro and Milner, two two very good additions, and helps cushion the blow of McAllis losing McAllister and potentially Caicedo as well. But still, they they still need to do more business. Mm. Well, you touched on it there, Darren. Jao Pedro's goal return last season, he got eleven in thirty-five championship appearances for Watford. Um, without meaning to sound like I've got the knives out from already, Frankie, do you think <laughs> it will be a burden of expectation on him to improve his goal return, considering they have paid a club record thirty million pound fee for him? No, I, I don't think so. Certainly not from the club. I think when looking at the signing, um, I think the fact that he can play up front as a number 10 and also on the left uh, means he's going to fit very much into like a very fluid attacking system. I think uh, if you look at the goal contributions last season, I don't think uh, Brighton scored 91 goals in all competitions and they weren't reliant on a, on a, I know Ferguson got more than 10 goals, but it wasn't the 20 goal a season man as everyone in football speaks. But I think De Zerbe's style of football requires goals from all areas. I think certainly from wide areas, um, Matoma and March uh, contributing 34 goals and assists um, that was huge that was pivotal I think he's based that on the success of the Guardiola Manchester City team and the and the Klopp Liverpool team uh, from years gone by of uh, goals from wide areas and that attacking threat not only being crossed into the box but also getting on the end of crosses um, so I think the fact that he can play out on the left will mean that I don't think he even starts, to be honest. If I'm being brutally honest, yeah. I think next season, I think the fact that he can come off the bench to give Matoma rest or for the European games or the cup games, Matoma doesn't have to play every single week, means that he can keep that attacking threat fresh for the whole season because to, as we mentioned before the end the last two months of the season Matoma looked very tired and and yeah. his his threat seemed to dwindle uh, week mm -hmm. by week. So the fact that um, Pedro can cover for that will be pivotal and the fact that he now adds another dynamic up front so we have Welbeck and Ferguson they play very similar in the fact they're more the physical aggressive classic number nine uh, but we've also got Undav who came into form at the end of last season he looked a lot sharper looked brighter uh, scored five goals in his last eight games can play as a 10 and a nine as well um, and then uh, also Buonate and Nciso uh, Buonate still yet to find his feet but again is another attacking option out wide and Nciso uh, really sort of hit the ground running towards the end of the season who can play in a number of positions up front I think having someone like Pedro who can do those roles as well and has the quality to play in the Premier League. We've seen he's got the quality when he was there. He was at, um, in the Prem previously with the Hornets, although he was in a really struggling side. We could see the, the attacking qualities there. He's good. He's got his dribbling. He's quick. He's got a, he's got an eye for a trick as well, so he can get fans off his seat. So the fact that Brighton are playing three games a week and can basically interchange these players, very similar to Manchester City do, that they won't just be reliant on March, Matoma, Ferguson, game in, game out, because that won't work. Um, I think that the pressure is off Pedro, to be honest. I think, I don't think anyone should be expecting him to be starting number nine, scoring two goals every single game or a goal a game. I think it's a case of whoever they're playing, he can be interchanged alongside these, these strikers because it's all new to them. None of them have played European, top European football before, so they will need rest. They will need breaks. They will need runs out of the team, the starting 11. Uh, and in doing so, I think they'll be more threatening in each game. Um, so it, the price tag is a record for Brian. I don't think it will be the record by the end of this window, by the way. I no. think Brian will probably break it, if not for Levi Colwell, for somebody else. Um, so I don't think that tag will be on him come the first game of the season. And he's not the finished product either. He's only 21, so still a lot to, mm -hmm. to learn and develop as well. And I think De Zerbi is aware of that um, and will know how to manage that. Um, 
and yeah so 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 to in answer to your question i don't think there is going to be a lot expected of him i think we'll see a very slow development i don't think he'll really hit his true form until late next season later to the end to late till later on this season well, you've, again, you brought up uh, Levi Carway there. Uh, Brighton continue to link with moves for not just the Chelsea defender, but midfielder Mahmoud Dahoud as well. Um, Darren, have there been any further developments with these signings and should support uh, Seagull supporters be worried about these deals potentially not happening? <clears throat> It's. I think Dahoud is is uh, is is as good as confirmed as as you could get. That seems to be um, seems to be the most likely out of the two that we should have um, confirmed. Um, perhaps early early next week. I think Colwell is is a bit more of a tricky situation. Um, it's chaotic at Chelsea, isn't it, at the, at the moment? <laughs> and who who are they going to keep? Who's going to go? Um, they have the financial fair play issues. They're going to. Potticino's got to assess all his defenders. They have a, a huge squad and he's going to have to see where Levi Colwell fits into that. You, you kind of think that Colwell would be a player that Potticino would love. You, you think he would be, uh, as he's proved in the past at, at Tottenham at Southampton, he, he, he brings on these, these younger players who, um, who have the, the proven that he, he's got the ability. And you'd think that Levi Colwell would be a Potticino type player mm. if in an ideal world, but Chelsea's hand may be forced um, in the fact that Colwell has stayed, you know, he seems to want to stay at Brighton and the fact that, that Chelsea do need to um, to move some players on to adhere to the to the um, financial fair play. So so that could work in Brighton's favour. But I think it's that that one could take a little bit more time uh, to come to fruition uh, if, if it does. But I, I personally, I really hope it does. I think he would be a great sign in. As Frankie said, 40 million would would break break, break uh, the transfer record that they paid for for Pedro, and with he's just been called up to the England squad as well, so yeah. that could add another five or ten million to his price tag on top of that as as well. So, so who who knows with, with that one? I really hope they can get it over the line. I think he's he's an excellent player. He he link he balances on that left side so well with um, uh, with Lewis Dunk or, or with Adam Webster. I think it's something Brighton have lacked. Um, since since Dan Byrne left, um, and he, he adds he added so much balance to that defence at the highest level, even for such a young age. And I think he would only get better under De Zerbi. But um, fingers crossed, they can get get the deal done. Uh, well, speaking of England, um, Albion skipper Lewis Dunk has unfortunately withdrawn from the three lion squad for the upcoming Euro 2024 qualifiers against Malta and North Macedonia, respectively, due to injury. Uh, Dunk's only previous England cap came against the United States in 2018, uh, but he was recalled to Southgate squad after helping Brighton qualify for Europe for the first time in the club's history last season. Um, gutting for Dunk, Frankie. Um, how much of a bit of blow is that for him? And do you think that we might see him in an England squad again in the future? Yeah, it's such a shame for him. He's worked so hard to to, to get into the England squad. Everyone said it was uh far too late his call up after such a great season mm. um but yeah it's it's a bit of blow but i don't i don't think it's the end i think southgate isn't one of those sort of people it's not like um he can't trust dunk i think it's more a case of he's he's shown his his commitment to brighton i think that's one of the only things you can take yeah. from it. he's been so mm. committed to the cause and dedicated to to the vision that he's played through the pain he's played through what seems like quite a quite a bad injury really i think the fact that he's had to pull out of an england squad a, you know at least two, three weeks after the season's finished and miss the last two games of the season for Brian shows that he was really having to grin and bear it to to, to keep uh, the dream alive of playing European football and be a part of that. And also not dropping his performance. I think mm. when you watch Dunk play in those games, I don't think anyone ever said, God, he looks like he's struggling. Um, so I think there's no, there's no doubt that Southgate will definitely consider him again, as long as obviously he starts next season at the same levels he, he finished last year. And I definitely think he's in, he's in line for another call-up. Apart from the fact that he, he's got to worry about his defensive partner maybe taking his position, Levi Colwell <laughs> has been named as his, has been training with the first team squad. Apparently Southgate very much likes him and mm. can see him as a replacement to Harry Maguire. Uh, if he has a success, I mean, Southgate obviously likes him from working with him or his coach is working with him in the under-21 setup. Um, if he has a successful Euros tournament, obviously the under-21s are playing in Romania and Georgia uh, in two weeks' time. Colwell is a part of that squad. 
if he does a successful tour, if he has a successful tournament, sorry, and maybe gets a, a full senior cap this summer, he might be the the replacement for Dunk. So I think that's the only thing that he's got to worry about is the uh, is the apprentice might become the master. Um, <laughs> but but, it, but other but other than that, if if Dunk continues to play the way he did last season, I'm sure he will still be considered. Uh, before we move on to Crawley Town, anyone remotely excited about England's qualifiers? I think we've had this conversation before and it was a resounding no from everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you, you, with, with the opposite, you, you'd hope that England have enough to uh, to, to cruise through these these two matches. Um, it's, it's, I think it's one of those where it's the end it's the end of the season the players would ideally want to be uh resting for the next next campaign but they have to get the job done and then move on uh, just a quick one on the under 21s as well that frankie mm. mentioned it's good to see carl rushworth in there as well yes. he's uh he was selected in the under 21 squad so he looks a great prospect for for brighton as as well in between the sticks frankie doesn't move the dial for you no, as much as I'm missing football, um, yeah, <laughs> don't miss England, it that England, much. England, England qualifiers against Leicester opposition don't seem to appeal me, and especially the fact that Dunk is is not playing. Um, I'd hope I would like to see someone like Levi Cole get get a, a yeah. run out. I think those are the only things you can see as beneficial from these games if you see a younger player and get his opportunity in the team. Um, but other than that, I'm I'm not particularly interested. I'm, you know, obviously, two wins should be expected, and, yeah. and that should really be it. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the Crawley Town front, Mark, uh, you spoke to Reds boss Scott Lindsay this week. Uh, you can read the full interview online at sussexworld.co.uk forward slash sport and in this week's Crawley Observer. Um, the main takeaway, I think, was Lindsay saying he was in no rush uh, when it comes to summer transfers. Um, do you think Crawley fans would be pleased to hear this? I guess it shows the Reds will be taking a considered approach to player recruitment this summer. Yeah, I think it will be frustrating for the fans because they're seeing um, seeing transfers happening all over the place. Um We'll come to it in a minute, but the CTSA have done a podcast with the Real EFL, and one of the one of their beefs is that there's been no activity and no even suggestion that they're probably going to sign anyone. Um, and they they cited Wrexham and Notts County are making good moves in the market and that. And yeah, they're, they're, it's just going to be a little bit frustrating for them. But what Lindsay's saying is because I asked him specifically about um, Remy Ote about how the contract is there. And he just kept saying, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of plates spinning. If we do that, then we need to get rid of someone else. And he said it would take about an hour to explain all the sort of ins and outs of why one thing will affect a lot of other things. So there will be, have to be players leaving before they bring someone in because of the, the budget, etc. So it is going to be frustrating for Crawley fans. But Scott Lindsay's not, he said he's not panicking. He They're in no rush, as you said. And I think they will take a considered mm -hmm. approach. And I think he has got players in mind. And I'm assuming the, the way he was talking, it sounded like those players know that Crawley want them and they're probably interested. But it's just a case of making all those rights, that doing the things in the right order of Remy signing a new contract, mm -hmm. certain players leaving, and then maybe they can start to bring people in. But we said it again last week, June the 24th was when they signed Dom Talford mm -hmm. last year. And lots of players followed from that. So... No need to panic as yet, but um, I think just to appease the fans, I think they do just need to make some uh, some movements quite quickly. Well, speaking of the fans, uh, the Crawley Town Supporters Alliance also announced the results of the vote to ensure the best future of the club. 60% uh, of CTSA members voted to pursue alternative legal means to replace current co-chairman Evan Smith and Preston Johnson. Uh, the CTSA said they were liaising with a range of stakeholders such as the Football Supporters Association and Black Supporters Trust to ensure the best future for our club. Uh, I know in the past... Uh, we've been a little bit critical of certain aspects of the Wagner United ownership, but did this strike you as a little bit extreme, Mark? Um, I was saying to Darren and Frankie, you, you look at the example of Wigan Athletic where they're not paying players, and it certainly shows things could potentially be a lot worse for Corey Town. Oh, absolutely, I think it is. I, I mean, it is maybe a little bit extreme in my, my humble opinion. Mm. Uh, I don't know if it's an overreaction, but they do care about their football club, these fans, and they obviously just want the best and they want to protect the future. What they saw happen last year was they struggled in the league. They nearly got relegated out of the football league. Players were sold. Chairman was uh, sat on the dugout for a game. <laughs> so they saw a lot of things going on that probably shouldn't happen at a football club or they think shouldn't happen at their football club. But they are the owners and they 
they're going to make mistakes. Tell, show me a football club owner. I mean, we could talk about Brighton. Brighton seemed to be the sort of absolute pinnacle of how you should run a football club with the with the relationship between the owner and the chairman and the chief executive, etc. But they're going to make mistakes, and they have made mistakes, and they will openly say they've made mistakes, wag me. But have they made the worst mistakes in the world? I don't think they have. They've just run a football club a little bit poorly. Hmm. Um, which has resulted in them nearly, like we said, nearly getting relegated. But on the CTSA side, yes, I do get where they're coming from because they just they don't want to see the same thing all over again. They don't want to go through all the pain that they went through last season. So um, I know, as I just mentioned previously, they, they have done a podcast with the Real AFL and that is being released at 2 o'clock this afternoon. I won't break any embargoes or anything on that, but they do talk about why they've taken this step, why Blackpool in particular, we all know what happened with Blackpool. Um, they, they ended up boycotting the club and that. And mm. Crawley don't want to get to that point. Mm. The, the, the fans certainly don't. And they, they do want to they do want to see, they do actually say, and this is not breaking any embargoes or anything, they do want to work with Wagme. They want Wagme to engage with them. But as we've said previously on previous week's podcasts and that, the, the, the relationship just isn't there. Yeah. between the owners and the fans and that's what needs fixing and i think by taking this step i think they hope that by having this mandate in their back pocket to take action if they have to they will but i think the first steps they really do want to work with with Wagby and basically get it sorted for next season i would well I, I would say that the fact that they've got a mandate where they want to remove the current chairman shows that they probably don't want to work with them and would i be wrong to suggest that it just strikes me a bit odd that they say they want to work with them and also want shot of them at the same time um i do yeah when i was watching the podcast which i was i was pleased to be able to see it before it goes live there was i did get that little bit of contradictory messaging coming across but if if wag me succeeding means the club is going to succeed the ctsa ctsa will be happy with that yeah. but i think if wag me do not engage now now that they've done this vote now that they've done this podcast where they publicly call out for wag me to engage with them if they don't i think then they will have to take things into their own hands and see what they can do in liaison with the like you say the football supporters association and with advice from other people and that so mm. it's it's going to be an interesting situation going forward. Um, and, yeah, we'll follow it closely, as closely as we always do. Never quiet, Crawley, is it, Mark? <laughs> it's never quiet, Crawley, and it's the blimming cricket season. I shouldn't be writing about things like this. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you are in luck, Mr Dunford. Uh, changing gears, uh, the Sussex Cricket League is in full swing, and there are shots of plenty to be found in the Premier Division. Uh, newly promoted Cookfield lead the way at the top, while last season champions Ruffy are winless and sit bottom of the mission. Um don't think many would have predicted that at the start of the season, Mark. Um, do you think Cookfield can maintain their title charge? And why do you think Ruffy have struggled so far this season? Well, it's um, great to see Cookfield up there because it, it, this year looks like the most interesting Sussex mm. Premier Division we've had for quite a while. It's normally Ruffy or East Grinstead going to win it and then you could tell who's going to go down. Mm. Normally the teams that have got promoted. Yeah. But um, it's uh, it's a fascinating start to the season. Cookfield, they made a couple of... Well, they made sort of three key signings, I think. It was we uh, Wesley Marshall, the South African, who's come over and he's he looks like he's making a real impact. He hasn't, hasn't scored loads of He's scored 100 in the first game of the season and then he's got 40s in there. But he's taken a few wickets in there. And I think just his experience... Um, has held them. They got Alex Fornhill, who came over from Glind. He's scored his first Premier Division hundred this weekend. Um, and uh, Will Goss, who came from St Peter's, he's um, a very highly rated young spinner. I think he, he's in the county setup. Um, so yeah, they've got a good team, and then plus they've got the players that they've always had there, like Ben Canfield, um, Nick Patterson, and that. So they've got people who have been in the Premier Division before. So it was quite a shock when they went down this season. They mm. romped Division Two last year. I thought they would do okay this year, but I didn't expect to start like this. And they've beaten some good teams already, so there's no reason why they cannot maintain this and that. It's just whether in the timed cricket, um, the win, lose or draw cricket, sorry, that whether they can force victories. They proved they could last week against Eastbourne, who are a team that are struggling. But, well, um, it'll be interesting to see them. But Ruffy, I, don't, I can't give you an answer why it's gone mm. wrong, <laughs> why it's going so wrong there. 
The preseason didn't help, obviously, but they're not the only team that didn't play any preseason friendlies. They didn't get warmed up or anything. And then their first two league games of the season were called off, whereas everyone's first league game of the season was called off. Their first two, and I think, um, I can't remember who the other team was whose first team was called off um, game of the season. Free Bridges as well. Um, but they've sort of come into the season quite cold, and yeah. it's their batting that has really struggled. And they Nick Nick Greenwood hit 100 against Horsham. He looks impressive. The New Zealander that's come over, but yeah, and they've got Johnny Phelps who came from Hayward Heath, who's scores loads of runs, takes loads of wickets in Division Two. Didn't quite do it when he came up with Hayward Heath a couple of seasons ago. They got relegated, and he hasn't quite fired yet. And obviously, they he came in to replace Rohit, who unfortunately yeah. is very ill. Mm. Rohit is an incredible player. Um, he played some of the best innings I've seen when I've um, been umpiring in the Sussex Premier League. And he is a huge loss for any side. Um, and not to have his runs and wickets and just his experience and his um, leadership, I think, is a bit, has had a big impact on them. But they've still got a lot of the core team. Mm. The, um, they did lose Jazz Bassan, who took a load of wickets for them last year. He's gone back to a team in Kenneth, I think Bexley Heath, maybe. Um, he was a good player, but there's not enough players to lose for a team like Rocky to be at the bottom like this. So I can't, I'll be surprised if they stay there. I think they will start to click and they will start to get some wins together. It's, um, I think Eastbourne and Mayfield are possibly the teams that will be the team to struggle, but Mayfield beat Rocky in the weekend. Yeah. So it's difficult. I mean, that's a long rambling answer, but um, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. Um, I, th I mean, Looking at the actual teams, Horsham and East Grinstead are the two teams that you can never write off. Yeah. They've got such experience, and Horsham with the additions of Bay Foreman this year and Charlie Tear, they they look a good side, Horsham. And I think they um they will be up there. If um if Cookfield do drop off Horford, Horsham will be ready to pounce and yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see them lift the title. Uh, would Horsham also be dependent on Sussex participation? In the past, they've not had, well, I wouldn't say much luck, but they've had plenty of players been picked for the county side, which has derailed yeah. challenges in the past. Exactly, yeah. Um, but we're, like the two players I just mentioned, they, Foreman and Charlie, yeah, they, they were both in the England under-19 setup mm. over the winter. Um, and obviously, they'll, they'll be on Sussex's books as well. And yeah, who knows, they could be called in. But um, George Garton, you hardly saw him last season yeah. anyway. So he, he's someone... I know he was due to play the first game of the season that was called off against Mayfield. Oh. But they I don't think they would see him much anyway. Obviously, Will Beer is not in the setup anymore, so he's a constant. You've got Nick Oxley. Yeah. Um, Sam Martin Jenkins is a good young bowler. James Brayhawk, a young bowler. But I don't think they'll be as disrupted as they have done in previous seasons. So I think more consistency in their in their team selection. I think, yeah, I think they, they will be the team to beat this year. Has there been anything else that's caught your eye in Divisions 2 and 3, Mark? I've seen that Stenning and St Peter's look like they've started incredibly well in Divisions 3, uh, West and East, respectively. Yeah, in, so in the top four divisions there, the um, Premier Div 1, uh, sorry, Div 2 and the two Div 3s, the two top run scorers are in, or the three top run scorers are in those innings. And it's um, Stenning, you've got Howell Jones, he mm. scored 331 runs so far, an average of 165.5. <laughs> um, so he his runs are giving them the good start standing. So that's really caught my eye. And Raj, Rajas Dupa has scored 546 runs for St. Peter's. So, um, <laughs> which is mad. He scored 300s and 250s so far. So St. Peter's, obviously, they were in Div 2 last year, got relegated. Um but in Div 2, actually, looking at them, Worthing have had a really good start. They got promoted from Div um, 3 uh, West last season, and they, they are absolutely flying. They've won four of the six games. They've got a really good side. Dominic Claps playing for them, led by Harry Dunn, who's a really good spinner. Daryl Rebetz, who was at East Grinstead, said used to be East Grinstead's first team captain. So Worthing got a really good side. Hastings have had a good start. They were always they are going to be a bit of a yo-yo team, Hastings, I think. But... Um, yeah, no, it's um, Div 2 is always such a really good competitive league. And uh, yeah, I mean, Burgess Hill at bottom, but their first three games, I think they lost in the last over of each of those games. So they were so close to mm. winning them. So um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's yeah, some really good cricket going on and it's going to be uh, highly competitive in all those divisions. But I think, like you just mentioned, Stenning and um, Stenning and St. Peter's are going to run away with those two leagues, I think, with those players in form. 
Who's your bet to go up then from Div 2 into the Premier? I think Hastings will. Um, and actually looking at it, I think um, it will be between <laughs> Worthing and West Shilton. If Worthing can keep it up, and they, there's no reason why they can't because they, they again, they're a team that if they have keep with consistent team selection, they will go up. But I think it's between Worthing. I think Hastings will definitely go up. They've just they kept the same side, most of the same side that um, got relegated from the Premier Division. Um, and they did pull off some good wins last year in the Premier Division, so I think they will go up. But Worthing, West Chiltington, they'll be the other two. But Buxted Park and Crowhurst Park, they got promoted from Div 3 mm. East last year. They're in fourth and fifth at the moment. So it's it's just a really competitive league. Hayward Teeth seem to be struggling, though. They're normally up there, but they lost Johnny Phelps, their star man. So um, they will struggle. But yeah, Hastings definitely to go up. And then I think between Worthing and West Chiltington, that's my tip. Well, tomorrow uh, sees the start of the Ashes and Sussex players past and present will represent England and Australia this summer. Uh, pace bowler Ollie Robinson has been named in the England squad for the first test and in an interview with City AM, ex-England captain Nasser Hussain said the 29-year-old is England's secret Ashes weapon. Uh, Hussain went on to say if it weren't for Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad, who aren't bad, to be fair, people would be singing from the rooftops about Robinson. Um, would you agree with Hussain's statement, Frankie? And, and how do you think Robinson will fare against the World Test Champions? <clears throat> Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, I think before um, the McCullen Stokes era began and, and, and the back term Baz ball was coined, Robinson was the only the, one of the few bright sparks from what was quite a dire period of English Test cricket. He was a very high, he's a very highly skilled bowler. He, he proved that he could do it on on the uh, international stage, even though they were drubbed four 0 in Australia. I thought Robinson played particularly well. I think he always bowled a good line in length. He's, I think he's averaged his 21 runs per, per his, uh, every test wicket, which is a fantastic mm. uh, return. Um, and so I, I think he, I think they have every right to be one of the, seen as one of the, the bright sparks of what could be a, a monumental Ashes, could make him as an Ashes player and, and make him as a an England legend this summer. Um, I think, you know, we, a lot has been spoken about um, England's test team recently about their batting, about how exciting it is going at five and over, declaring um, scores which look at, uh, in slight jeopardy, and, and attacking teams for uh, you know going and winning games when they're having to chase scores of over two hundred and fifty or over three hundred. It's been great to watch, but I think the key attribute has been their bowling. Um, I think under Joe Root's leadership, a lot of the times in the games that they were winning, they looked a bit lost um, when they were bowling in the certainly in the second innings. They seem to not really have a plan or or how to to grab the game and, and, and sort of strangle out the victory. But under Ben Stokes, that's completely changed. I think especially against Pakistan and, and New Zealand uh, in the winter, they were really going full frost. And I think that suits Robinson down to the ground. I think he's an aggressive bowler. He's an attacking bowler, likes to take wickets. Um, and this style of, of play uh, is, 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 is suits him down to the ground. And I think for England to, to, to be successful this Ashes, I think they have to play at, you know on heat. But I think, I think there's no, there's no, there's no, reason why they could they shouldn't go for it full throttle again because if they if they try and do anything different i think they i think they will be found out because this is the the well they've been they've they're officially the best test team in the world now but i think that was already known i think this is a very very strong team and the gap between australia touring england with england touring in australia the the side australia coming to england they have become better and better every time they've yeah. toured and i think that gap is the smallest it's ever been if i'm truth be told um so england need to play the, the, the thing that's got them to be one of the most successful teams of the last two years, which is which is the aggressive Australian-like style of Test cricket, which is going at it for scoring at a high run rate and, and looking to to attack with your bowling straight from the off. And Robinson suits that down to the ground. He's, you know, we've seen how what he speaks about in the press about he feels that Australia, he, they can England can give them a good hiding. His his verbal sledging with Virat Kohli last summer. He's, you know, he's actually quite Australian in in the way that he plays <laughs> and goes about the game. But I think that is the best way to be. I think that's what we love as cricket fans. We love to be entertained. We love to have that um, controversial figure, which I think Robinson is. I mean, I know he had, there were some issues mm -hmm. at the start of his test career with the, with the tweet gate from, from 10 years prior. But, you know, outside of that, he's very, you know, he's a, he's a colourful character. He's an aggressive player. And I think he will, he will lead, he will be the key factor for England playing well because, I understand the inclusion of um, Stuart Broad for the first test. Obviously, his know-how, his experience is a great record against David Warner. Um, but I would like to see Mark Wood play, if I'm honest. Mm. I think if we could, if going with two all-out fast seamers like Robinson and Wood 
really suits uh, Ben Stokes' style of cricket. But, you know, I'm not going to question their decision making at the moment. Every decision he's made over the last year and a half has turned to gold. But, yes, um, England have a great chance of, of winning this Ash. They didn't before Ben Stokes and McCullum were appointed, but they have a great chance now. Uh, and Ollie Robinson's uh, bowling and, and his style of play suits this team down to the ground and be key to them winning this Ashes. Uh, well, meanwhile, uh, ex-Sussex star Travis Head has been picked for Australia when we're coming into the ashes of the back of an outstanding performance against India in last week's World Test Championship final. Uh, Head was named player of the match following his explosive 174 ball, 163 in Australia's first innings. And Head also has previous against England too, scoring 101 in the first innings of Australia's 146 run win in the fifth Ashes Test match in Hobart. Um, Head failed to fire, though, while at Sussex, scoring just 183 runs in 11 county championship innings in 2021. Um, but he seems to have passed, become a valuable asset for Australia. Is he another player that we need to be wary of this summer, Mark? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you called him ex-Sussex star. It was that's quite a stretch calling him a star at Sussex. You know? <laughs> he was. I don't think I've ever been so disappointed by an overseas player at um, Sussex. Incredible. But his form in test matches has been incredible. And I was having this conversation with my brother who might dislike the Australians more than you, Matt. Um, oh, and uh, we were discussing which Australians would you have in the England team right now if you could do a combined 11. I'm not a big fan of combined 11s. but And I actually said, I think at the moment, Travis Head is probably the only one I would that would fit into England's team at the moment mm, in yeah. terms of style. Because, yeah, Steve Smith, best bats, one of the best batsmen in the world. You've got Joe Root. You don't need Steve Smith. Yeah. You've got Joe Root. Um, Labashane, maybe. Um, but I wouldn't replace Bearstow Stokes or anyone like that with Labashane. Um, the only uh, with Jack Leach now out, maybe Nathan Lyon, you would want him in because a special yes. spinner and he is quality. But Travis Head has just been incredible. I mean, his mm. cash is a bit questionable, but um, <laughs> he 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 comes in and he he plays the way that England want to be playing, and I think he, he's great to watch. And yeah, I think England have to be very wary of him because they. I think he will fight fire with fire, and uh, it will be it will be great to see. But I'm so excited about this Ashes series. I yeah. think it's just going to mm -hmm. be absolutely. It's going to be 2005 all over again. And, yeah, and, um, and uh, I, I cannot wait. But yeah, Tra I think Travis Head will be the biggest, possibly the biggest danger man. If we can get Smith out, then we won't. If we get Smith and Labuschagne out, <laughs> you think, all right, we're on top now. And then yeah. Head comes in and hits his hundred off hundred balls, and. Yeah, yeah, we've got to be wary. So I'm assuming, like you said, like Frankie said, every decision Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum have made have been perfect so far. They'll have a plan for Travis Head, I'm sure. And Ollie Robinson, I imagine, is part of that because he is such a skilled player and he will know Travis Head from his Sussex days. Mm. So yeah. they'll be pulling on that experience, I'd hope, to try and work out how to um, get him out early. But it's, it's going to be fascinating. And um, I know we're going to do score predictions in a minute, so I won't, I won't preempt you with that. <laughs> oh no, go ahead. What, what, how do you see it going? What, what, what are you predicting for a score, Mark? I was going to call it Steve well, Bone Score Prediction Corner, but we might call it Steve War Score Prediction Corner. Um, um, <laughs> I think England will win. Mm. Um, I, I made a break because somebody asked me this the other day and I made a brave 3 0 prediction and Australia <laughs> would scrape a couple of draws. But I, I now I, I just can't see there being a draw. I just think mm. both teams will be going for it. So I'm going to I'm going to go three to England. I think it will be an absolute thriller. I think Australia will win at least one yeah. test, um, yeah. and it, it might be early on, and that might fire England up a little bit. But three, I'll go I'll go three to England. Why not? Frankie, how do you see it going? <clears throat> yeah, I'm 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 with Mark. I, this is a with the weather and and b with the two teams that are playing. I can't see a draw taking place some i don't think it's in either team's nature the thing that has given me a bit more fear is australia's performance against india um, yes. last week they played they played excellently uh, like i said they i don't think the english conditions thing can be in england's favor anymore i think australians are very well suited mm. to playing in england um especially obviously we know steve smith's record in england uh, from the last ashes mm. series um and also labashane was very good in England last time um and obviously travis head's record everywhere at the moment has been has been incredible so this is probably the best batting lineup basball's come up against um so i think if england's bowling lineup can play as well as they have done on recent series I think it will be an England win. I think it will be a, a, a free to England win. If they, I think Edge Baston, the first day, how that toss goes and how England bowl in that first test will really give us an insight into how 
they mm. can play for the whole song because if Australia get on top, it could be difficult. It could be difficult. Uh, Darren, how do you see it going? <clears throat> yeah, I can see England coming out on top. I think this is what the they've been building towards since McCullum's taken over when uh, when he was appointed. England were, you know, no one wanted to watch them, did they? They were just so so poor, and he's implemented a sort of a style of play that's that's come about so quickly that the transition has been so fast and i think um this is now what they've been building towards and i can't see him taking a back step in this one i think they're just going to go as frankie said it's going to be they're going to be at full throttle they're not going to rein it back at all i think they're just going to be on the attack which again it's a high risk approach but you know that's what that's what you want to tune into test cricket to see you want to see these mm -hmm. two Two of the best teams of the world, the biggest rivalry in the world, cricket, maybe bar, you know, India might sort of say, but England versus Australia is such a such a great occasion and it's gonna be a nice summer by the looks of it and two two great teams. And I, I think England will come out on top, especially I think at Edgbaston they're gonna get off to a good um a, a good a good performance. And yeah, I can see England taking it maybe sort of three one. I can't wait for Australia to be 250 without loss at lunch on the first day. Anyway, can I just talk India, um, Australia down a little bit? Because Frankie mentioned about how impressive they were against India. Please do. I think, Please I think do. there was a lot of mitigating factors there. They didn't pick Ashwin, which was a huge mistake. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like him as a player. He's just uh, one of those annoying <laughs> characters. But he, um, he's a great player. Why they left him out and the toss mm. as well. It would have been interesting if India had batted first. Um, and, yeah, because the sun came out very quickly that day, didn't it? And uh, yeah. if, Co if Kohli was there on the first day, he could have been 113 mm -hmm. not out at the end of the first day. So it was an impressive win. They You can only beat what's in front of you, and they did absolutely mm -hmm. batter them in the end. But it, it, a couple of little sliding doors moments, it could have been mm -hmm. completely different, and Australia yeah. could have come into this test sort of bit demotivated because they've just been hammered by and bowled out by um ashwin so yeah no but they are an impressive side australia and it is going to be tough uh very 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 finally where do you see the weaknesses being then mark and frankie for australia oh it's a good question um i think i think who who they pick because i think i would pick scott boland ahead of josh hazelwood yeah. but i don't mm. think they're going to do that um so I think in their selection might be weaknesses and their their their, their openness. I mean, David Warner hopefully will. Yeah. He's not in form at all. Um, Kawaja, he uh, he didn't look too good against um, India. So um, never played one in England either, Kawaja. No, no, exactly. Yeah, it's that that swinging ball. You'd like to think that Jimmy just they, they'll both be rabbits for Jimmy and uh, Stuart and Ollie Robinson as well. So. Yeah. If they can get those early, get Steve Smith in and Labashain in as early as possible and put them under pressure early, I think that's where their weakness could be. Is Mo and Ali going to play at Yeah, I think yeah so. he will start, yeah. So I think, I think they, 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 will, they will target him, won't they, Frankie, I think. Yeah, um, I think I think that's the thing is the other issue that England haven't been able to fix yet with Baz Boys is, is the Nathan mm -hmm. Lyon factor. I think his having not only a good spinner, a world-class spinner on your side, it, it has been a, a huge factor in recent years. Mm -hmm. England haven't seemed to have that since, well, since Graham Swan. Um, and mm -hmm. Mo and Ali is a, you know, he's a, he is a brilliant asset. He's a big game player as well. And I think, you know, England have been, he has been a reliable source for England for years, but he isn't the same level as Lyon, especially not at the age he is now. Um, so that will be a huge factor. And I also think, I think the big factor will be the fact that Ben Stokes can't bowl. Um, mm. Obviously, he's been he's been struggling. They've been saying he's been he has been bowling in the net to Edgbaston this week. Will he be able to bowl in the first test? It's unlikely, but he is a match winner both with the ball and the bat. Um, and the fact that he can't bowl means they'll be more reliant on Anderson and Broad, which, as great as they are, they are not young players. So I think the players like Robinson like Ali, if Stokes can bowl, those players being able to support Anderson and Broad will be pivotal because if like, as we said, if, if England, if Australia do manage to stay in for a long period of time, having to rely on those bowlers to bowl more overs because Stokes can't, could let, let lend to Australia running away with it. So those are the key battlefields, I think, for, for the first test. 
I must admit, without meaning to drag it on any longer, I was a little bit apprehensive about Mo and Ali coming back into the England team because I do seem to remember him being absolutely smacked around by Australia. Um, it's good that we've got him in, yeah. but do you think that we're probably pinning our hopes on him a little bit? Not hopes, but you know what I mean. Do you think we're kind of overestimating how big of an impact he's going to have this summer? Well, it, it, the thing is, although he can, he does go for quite, he can go for hefty sums and overs. He, that is also his asset because players try to attack him and, and can be careless. And he can also pick up a fiver from players trying to attack him too much and being caught in silly positions. So it, 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 I can see where it works and where it doesn't work. But also, he he is an asset with the bat as well. I mean, yeah. when he when he like if England are struggling. A top order collapse may happen, whatever. Mo and Ali is there and he is a very much a skilled batsman. So his experience and his ability to do both and also being an asset, like I said, in a, in a very obscure way from not bowling particularly well, uh, I think I think can actually help England. Um, and, he's, and he's a great character to have around. I think that's the thing. He's a leader in the team. Um, People you know, love him, captain. don't they? People, People love him. Yeah. Um, and, and those characters in Ashes games with big crowds that are raucous, they mean the world. They mean the world. Flintoff, Panstar, those sort of people. Warner, Smith, that you know, all that worn back in the day. Those players, they make Ashes. And I think Monelli is one of those people for sure. Anything to add on Murray and Mark? <clears throat> no, I think he's a great player. And um, I interviewed him uh, when Worcester Rapids won the T20 uh Vitality Blast in whenever it was um, pre-COVID. Um, it was the day Sussex got to the um, got to uh, the finals day as well. And uh, he he just he's just a lovely bloke, and he just knows what he wants. And he's he is like Frankie just said, he's such a leader. And you just got that impression sitting in the room with him. He just commands authority, kind of thing. And that you can't have too many leaders in the side, can you? I don't think. And yeah. um, I think Stokes will find that very invaluable just to have him there. With him as well i saw a quote from him he, he said that he's he can't make training uh the day before the ashes or the two days before because he's picking up his obe from windsor castle <laughs> <laughs> he, he, said, he said he said yeah i can play in the ashes but he said I, can, well, I won't be able to train this day because i've already booked my suit my family are there and i've got to collect my obe <laughs> <laughs> As excuses go, that's not too bad, I think. Not, not too bad. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you very much for this week, chaps, this bumper episode of uh, Sussex Sport Weekly. Uh, you can catch up with all the latest sports news covering everything we've talked about uh, today at sussexworld.co.uk forward slash sport. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and we will see you all next week. <clears throat>